Did you know that 90% of the world's millionaires invest in real estate? Well, I'm Angel with the Academy Presents Real Estate Investing Rocks, and I'm here to help you if you want to go for your piece of that pie. Hey guys, it's Angel with the Academy Presents Real Estate Investing Rocks, and we are super excited to have um, Mike Morawski on our episode today. He has been in real estate for a really long time. He's seen ups and downs. He's been doing this for, holy cow, what was it? Was it like over 30 years? Yeah. Yeah, a really long time. I like that. Nobody's ever said that before. No, I mean, the reason why I think that is so important is because there's a lot of people out there that have been doing this five years, even 10 years, and they think they've seen it all. And there's no possible way. Because I mean, like my grandparents were getting into this in the late 70s, early 80s. And so I got to see them get into it. And then I got to see like the stagflation hit, I got to see inflation hit, I've seen deflation. Um, my husband and I got in in 2003. So we got to see the bust. We got to see the recovery. We've got to be a part of that super long recession. But even though we've been in this for a while, nothing could have prepared us for what's going on right now. Yeah. And I feel like if you've seen more ups and downs, while this is completely different, you're still better prepared than someone that's been in it five, 10 years. And that's why I make a big deal of it because, you know, I don't think that experience is the be all end all all the time, but I think this is one of those situations where having that experience is really going to give you a hand up. So I'm not trying to say anything else other than kudos to you for having that kind of experience to draw on because it's going to, I think it's going to do nothing but benefit you. Yeah. Well, one thing that I always tell people too, Angel, is that I get asked a lot, why do you like real estate so much? Or why are you so passionate about real estate? And I say, because it never gets old. There's always something you can learn. You could do 200 unit deals and close them in the same month, go, go to contract at the same time, and the deals would be totally different. So nothing's ever the same, right? So everything keeps changing and I can always learn something. I don't think there's been a day that's gone by since I've got in real estate that I haven't learned something new within the industry, which is makes it much more appealing to stay involved. Right. I yeah, know it's um definitely ever changing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a, I have another friend that they've been in for, I guess this is, I think they just had their 19 year anniversary in real estate investing and um, they're, we're pretty close in age. Um, so they got started before we did um, by like, five or six, seven years. And um, the thing that she's proud of is how many uh, they've been through, I think three economic corrections, she says. Um, and they're very proud of that. And so having that, having, again, having that experience to draw on and that longevity can be a very big plus, especially if you're putting your operating team together and you're getting ready to plow ahead right now, you need to have that history and you need to be able to say, We've been through this three times. And for the people that are, for the operating teams that are getting through COVID right now successfully with amazing deals, man, the following they're going to be able to pull because this is a crazy time. Yeah. There's just so much uncertainty and so many, so many variables at play and like people that are wanting to like, wait, wait, wait until they think they're going to get the biggest discount. And so then they go ahead. I mean, the numbers are still great, even though they've gone ahead and maybe this is in the bottom, maybe this is like, a tertiary, like a, a preliminary bottom. And maybe there's going to be another bottom. Maybe there's going to be a lower bottom. I think we're going to double bottom in my opinion. <laughs> um, but I think that there's just, I don't know, there's just all of these things in play and to be successful right now is just, it's scary. I'm scared. Yeah. To I'm scared to go ahead. <laughs> hey, that's an interesting thought, a double bottom right now. Um, you mean that you think we're going to, we're going to come to a flat point and then go down even further? Yeah, I do. What do you think is going to cause that? Um, I think we have a lot of artificial stimulation right now in the market. Um, and so I think that like a lot of stuff is ending it on uh, December 31st. So after December 31st, there's going to be some of that artificial market manipulation that's on. And when I say artificial market manipulation, I'm talking like the stimulus package right, right. or like when the, when the $600 bonus stopped that $600 per week um, unemployment COVID bonus, right. when that ended, we saw some things happen. 
um, like we saw a few more people go into the to the workplace so to join to rejoin the workforce. They went back in and went ahead and got jobs. But when they were getting that extra six hundred a week, makes sense because they were making more sitting at home. And because of COVID, they didn't have to do their job search requirements, so there was no incentive to go back. So when that six hundred dollars per week stopped people went back to the workforce because then it made sense again. And that's some of that artificial market manipulation that I'm talking about. And, you know, it's still kind of the carrot and the stick thing right now, right? And I, uh, because they keep saying every time you look at something on social media or the news or one of these buzz wires, they're always talking about another stimulus package coming or something else. So it's kind of like they're leading people on because I don't see it happening, you know, and they've locked us, I'm in Chicago and they've kind of locked us down again. You know, there's a mandatory stay at home order and, you know, they don't want you going out and the restaurant in insides of restaurants are closed again. And it's, you know, it's kind of spooky actually that, that we had this control is going on. I wanted to make a comment though about them. Uh, the, those friends of yours who've seen market cycles, a couple of market cycles and, and, I believe, and one of the things I always say is success leaves clues. So if you find something, find someone that's been successful as a reason for specific reasons, follow that and figure out what they did. So these guys that have been through three market cycles, figure out how they got through those market cycles and they will give you some clues on how to withstand this one and the next one that comes, because they're going to come again. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So some of the things that I've seen I've really loved is um, I've got a few friends on a couple of different operating teams, and they've done things like they gave away free turkeys this Thanksgiving to all of their residents. Wow. So that, that, was, that was pretty neat, um, because that just shows you care. Um, and I think the other cool thing too, is that they really focus on the community in that complex. They, they do a really good job of not calling them tenants because they're residents yeah. and being like making them a part of that family. And while you can't really do like community activities, like the barbecue and stuff like that anymore to give turkeys to everyone still builds a sense of community because then everybody has a turkey. Everybody in this complex, everybody in this community still has the ability to now have a turkey dinner. And we're all going to be having a turkey dinner together during right. this Thanksgiving period. So there's still that building of community, even though it's not necessarily in a group setting. Yeah. And building of community was- like that, build, it, building of community like that helps tenant retention. And, and that I, in my uh, my thought is that tenant retention is probably one of the biggest things that an operator needs to get a handle on, because if you can cut your tenant retention down or, and have your tenants staying longer because they like living there and give them something more, I think it, it saves you a lot of money in the long run and creating creating cash flow or long-term wealth in real estate, which I teach about all the time. I really like teaching about is, and that's one of those skill sets. I believe it's a skill set, you know, that you acquire over time. You learn o- over time. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And um, we're passive in multifamily, but I see it in our single families. And while we have property managers, we're still, we don't necessarily go door to door. That's what my grandparents did. That's the reason why I don't self-manage <laughs> is because I remember my grandparents at the beginning of every month driving around to all of their rentals to pick up rent. And it was, um, yeah, when, when my grandmother passed away and my grandfather was still doing it, it was kind of heartbreaking to see him as he got older, you know, late sixties, moving into his seventies, still shuffling from rental to rental to pick up rent. And I felt like um, that was not something he needed to be doing. And so I actually found him a property manager <laughs> in his town that would get all the, get everything collected and make sure all of that got to the bank. But um, that was the reason why I didn't want to self-manage. But at the same time, 
by having that relationship with the tenants. They knew their tenants. One lady had been in their house for 18 years. And part of that was because they had built that relationship. My grandmother knew the family. She knew when the son had lost his job and moved back in, like back in with mom and how she was, they were working together to make ends meet and pay the bills. And my grandmother knew their story. And so there was a sense of community there, I believe. And that's why that person stayed in the house for 18 years. And then in one of their apartments, they had a woman that had been there 15 years. In one of their trailers, they had a woman that had been there 12 years. And so my grandmother did an amazing job building relationships and building community, even in the rentals that they had. But it was still scary to me to have to, or to find myself going door to door for the rest of my life to collect rents. And yeah. Well, yeah. But you know what? Again, this is one of those things that as you do it, the more often you do it, the the more you get accustomed to it, the more secure you get doing it. Now it just becomes second nature. And it's just part of part of the job, part of the business, right? And so then then you have a you have a choice. You can either keep doing it yourself or you can delegate it to somebody else. I'm I'm See, I'm all for delegating. Well what? Yeah, I think my grandmother loved loved it. It yeah. gave her something to do every month, and yeah, I think that was her thing. It wasn't my grandpa's thing, but he kept it up. I think part of it was he kept it up for her memory, but it just got harder for him, and sure, it hurt me to see him struggling. Yeah. So, and okay, we kind of like the way we do it too. Um, our property manager, he's really good. And the renters know him and they know that they can text him or call him and he'll get things taken care of. And um, so there, there's some sense of community too. And where we're at, we're actually in Wichita Falls and it's a pretty small town. It's like a hundred thousand people, but it's been a hundred thousand people since the 1960s. Oh, wow. <laughs> so yeah, so we're, we're kind of small and um, what's the word that everybody loves? Oh yeah. Stable. I might tend to call it stagnant, but um. <laughs> other people call it stable so we'll go with that it sounds like a much more positive word so so here's the thing that i realize when i do due diligence right is that if it's not going forward it's it's stuck it's it's going backwards but you know you you bring something really interesting up you said it's been a hundred thousand people since the 1960s you know, you can hardly say with that track record that it's going backwards. It might not be growing, but it's not going backwards. I mean, that's a long time to be at a at a population number, right? So I think we were we were 104 in 1960, and we're like 105 now. So it did go up. <laughs> yeah, 105,000. So a thousand people. <laughs> not in a couple of years, but it did go up, right? Hey, so. <laughs> But you have to, you know, so when you do evaluate a deal evaluation, especially on the front end, before you ever even enter into a contract on a deal, you, you need to look at that. That's one of those traps, right? Is you got to look at deal evaluation and see what the population is doing, see what the job growth is doing, see what the demographics are, the schools. But that's a long time to be at a certain number, you know? So um, are there good deals in your town? Um, so we actually just bought a small, a very small portfolio. Um, it took us to four single family homes here and it's a totally different class. We're, we're pretty solid B class people, um, apartments, homes, really, no matter what it is. My husband's family had real estate. They actually had 62 units of the residential multifamily. So the two to four unit. So they had 62 units between quads, triplexes and duplexes. And then my family, my grandparents had what did they have? They had three single families, a little quadplex apartment and a small trailer park. So I had grown up around real estate. My husband grew up in real estate because we always knew we were going to do real estate. Um, we have a single family home in Lubbock. That was the first one we ever bought. We bought it while Jason was finishing up his doctorate, knowing that when we moved, that would become our first rental. So we got our start in 03, but we didn't do the make ready till 06 and it got rented in 07. So that was our first single family. And then we got some more here in town. And then we got a few residential multifamilies there in Waco. And now we're 
LPing in some big multifamily syndications and my husband's ready to do his own syndication now. So it's, um, we did it all because we want to create, we want to use that real estate investing, you know, wealth machine to be able to build a legacy for our family so that our daughters, when my husband and I are gone, don't have to worry about where they're going to get the money to take care of their brother. All they have to do is love him because we will have funded a special needs trust that is going to take care of him for the rest of his life. And it's going to allow them as they reach certain ages to be able to become the trustees for that trust so that they can take care of their brother, but they don't have to come up with the financial means to do so. Yeah. So that, that was our why. That's what got us into real estate. You know, what's pretty interesting is you sound like you come from a, a family of real estate. So, fam so real estate was in your history, in your background. So it was something that was kind of, was it natural for you? Did it kind of just come together easy for you? You know, cause I tell a story where I, I had no real estate in my background. Yeah. So, um, I guess what really happened was it was, it was a natural progression for us. We bought that first house knowing it'd be our first rental. And I think where our history of having real estate in our families came into play was our very first renter. I mean, there's no other way to put it. Our very first renter sucked. Um, I'm not sure that renter made it a month. And when that renter left, left all of her crap behind. It cost us $500 just to clean out the house. And I feel like if we hadn't had our experiences that we did growing up in families in real estate, we would have turned and run. I think we would have sold it and we would have just said no more rentals for us, but we didn't. We paid to have it cleaned out and we got another renter in place. And we just said, hey, this stuff happens. It sucks that it happened on our first go round, but this stuff happened because we had seen it happen. Both of us had seen it happen to our parents. And, and so you know, we were able to keep pushing. That's the attitude, right? Is it happens, right? This stuff happens. I'll never forget. And you said something earlier that made me think about this because things go in cycles, right? Um, I remember reading Donald Trump's book, The Art of the Deal, years and years ago before I ever even got into real estate. And he says in that book, and this is the first time I ever heard this comment, that it's not when, it's not if you get sued, it's when you get sued. And that these things happen to you, whether it's being sued, whether it's an eviction, whether it's a tenant not paying and catching up, whether it, you know, no matter what it is, it's going to happen. It's not if, it's when. And, and you just need to be able to walk through those situations just like you did and get to the other side. And you look back and you go, wow, I learned a lot from that. That was really great. What a great experience. And you know, I'll never forget the first time I got sued. It was like I was prepared. But, you know, I had a tenant take me to housing court and say that I didn't fix the stove. So that's why they didn't pay the rent. And we were arguing about eviction. And it was just it would just got kind of crazy. But, you know, you get to the other side and you go, wow, look what I learned from that. And now I'm so much more prepared for the next time that or some other situation comes up. Right. Well, and, you know, that was um, something our father-in-law, my, my father-in-law said too. He was like, most of the people that you rent to think they're going to get rich one of three ways. They're going to inherit it. They're going to win the lottery or they're going to sue you for it. And so we have known that and just really embraced that for a really long time. And we work to make sure that we've CYA'd, whether it's through <laughs> insurance or creating that LLC or whatever it takes, because we were warned up front that it's going to happen because they expect the, it's that three ways to wealth inherit win the lottery or sue you for it or sue someone for it. That's interesting uh, that you were taught that lesson, you know, again, that goes back to success leaves clues, right? What lessons have, have you learned along the way that have helped shape you for what you do today, who you are today, right? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, when I think about it, a lot of successful hate it when you say, or that, or somebody tells them you, you were so lucky, you were so lucky, but there's a lot of times that I feel like we were lucky. We were lucky to grow up in the families that we did to, to see what we got to see. Um, yeah, not everybody. All, hey, Angel, all luck is, is leveraging upon common knowledge. So it's knowledge you had, right? And you just lever, leveraged on the knowledge. So that's where really luck comes in. I mean, you know, listen, 
I'm a, I'm a firm believer that massive action creates massive results. The more activity you put in, the more results you're going to get. It's like, it's like the funnel, you know, method, right? Put more into top, you're going to get plenty out the bottom. And it, it, so as a result of that, that's how that, that luck happens, right? Um, I, I come from a background of being in real estate sales. I was a listing agent. And so I knew that I had to make a lot of approaches every year in order to um, be successful, right? So what I did was I would dial the phone 20,000 times per year to get 125 sold listings at the end of the year. So I could tell you that every time I picked up the telephone, I made $8. Every time I dialed the telephone, I made $8. I sold 125 listings a year. I was a listing agent. I went on 200 and uh, I took 240 listings. I went on 325 listing appointments. So I could tell you my numbers, right? And, and that is, that's massive action that's moving in a positive direction, doing the right things. Wow. That's, that is so awesome though, because like personally, one of my biggest problems is valuing myself. Um, I have a, I have real problems with that. And so when it comes to like, people say, you know, how could you possibly feel like a fraud? Look at what you've done. And I'm like, I, you just do. And I heard a podcast, um, Andy Frisella podcast, maybe last week, where it talks about that feeling of being a fraud is what keeps you humble. Yeah. <laughs> um, but everybody feels it. And I think that that's really important to get out there because there seems to be like this lack of transparency a lot of times. And a lot of successful people, it's almost like they're embarrassed to say that they still feel like a fraud sometimes. And there's nothing embarrassing to that. It, I think it lets people know that you just want to be real with them. And there's something to learn every single day and you're never going to know it all. And so, so here's something interesting, right? I like, I like that whole conversation that you're starting right there. And, and one of the things that's really, uh, if you read my bio in my bio, I talk about being resilient and it's not, it's not about what happened to you, but it's about how you handle what happened to you, how you bounce back, what you do after a problem or after a challenge. So how do you handle it after that tenant takes you to court and maybe you lose? How do you handle it after there's a bigger issue? You know, so what do you do to make things different? How do you bounce back if you have a problem? You lost a place in foreclosure. You an, an investor lost their money, you know, how do you bounce back? What happens? So. Wow. Yeah. About, I don't even, it's about being resilient. Right. So, and here's, here's the thing. I think that there's, there's people in front of us that have done that. And again, success leaves clues. Wow. That's awesome. So like, I know why we got into real estate and I know that I think everybody has that defining moment um that pushed them into real estate what was kind of what was your like what was that moment for you when you were like you know what this is where I'm gonna go and this is how I'm gonna make it and this is gonna be my thing what was that for you so I have a couple of stories so um the first one remember I said that I didn't come from a family of real estate background so I'm on family vacation. I'm eight years old. My dad and I are sitting on the side of a swimming pool at this resort. And, uh, and I ask my dad, I say, I'm asking my dad about this resort that we're at and all the rooms and the doors and, and people. And he, in his little bit of wisdom, because he didn't know anything about real estate, looking back today, absolutely nothing. And in his little bit of wisdom, he said, well, people come here and they stay here, they vacation here, they live here and they pay the owner money. And at that moment, I knew I wanted to be the owner getting paid the money. Right. Awesome. So that was I think that that was my first venture at the real estate business of what is this all about and what does it mean? I, I you know, I think one of the next prominent points that I remember is 
I could, we'd be driving down the road and I would ask my mom, who owns these buildings? And she would tell me insurance companies. And little did I know later on in life, I was going to do deals with insurance companies and they were going to be my equity partner in deals. Right? So it's interesting how we learn some of these things.